Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are in the world. On behalf of USAID, Feed the Future, and AgriLinks, I welcome you to our webinar, The Use of Smart Subsidy in Impact Link Agricultural Finance. I am Michael Saltz with AgriLinks. Before we begin, let me orient you to the Blue Jeans platform. On the right side of your screen, you'll see most of your controls. First, please use the chat to introduce yourself and network with colleagues from around the world. To ask questions, please use the Q&A button on the bottom right. Please indicate who your question is for. Feel free to upvote questions you want answered. You can ask questions throughout the webinar. Our Q&A session will be at the end of the webinar. If the presentation is too small on your screen, you can use the slide bar at the bottom window to adjust the view. Lastly, we are recording this webinar and will email you the post-event resources as soon as they're available. You can also find the resources at AgriLinks when they are ready. Thank you for your attention. I will now pass it to USAID's Song Bailey. Thank you, Michael. Uh, welcome everyone to this webinar. This is Agricultural Finance Month on AgriLinks. Uh, AgriLinks is the USAID website on all things agriculture. And I'm going to ask my colleague, the other half of the Ag Finance team, Hans, to put a link inside the chat so people um, can check it out if they'd like to. Um, there's been a series of blogs posted this month, thanks to everyone who's also posted their own blogs and for following along. And this is the capstone webinar for the month. So um, again, Song Bei Li, Ag Finance Team Lead at USAID. I sit in DC in what I call for shorthand the Ag Bureau, but the full name is the Bureau for Resilience and Food Security. And it includes four centers, um, Nutrition, Resilience, WASH, and the Center for Ag-Led Growth. And that's where I sit in the Center for Ag-Led Growth. Uh, just wanted to mention that I had a hard time coming up with the title for this webinar because I really wanted it to be an open discussion and I wasn't sure what we were going to discuss. But I did have some broad goals and um, those were basically that we kind of discuss the roles of bilateral donors and DFIs first. And second, what is the most effective way for us to allocate our subsidy and the public financing that we provide? We did have to decide who to invite, and I'm very happy to um, go over our list of speakers, which include two bilateral donors, the Netherlands Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and also uh, MFA for short, and the Swiss Agency for Development and Cooperation, SDC. We also have one development finance institution, DFI, which is KFW, the German DFI. Um, because each of our governments is structured differently, we can't make an exact comparison, but just to help orient people, I would describe MFA and SDC doing similar work as USAID. And as an example of that, the three organizations all support Aceli Africa as donors. On the other hand, KFW is probably the most comparable with the US Development Finance Corporation, the DFC. And as an example of that, both KFW and DFC have supported interna international funds like the Fair Trade Access Fund managed by Incofin and the Insu Resilience Investment Fund managed by Blue Orchard. But I'll point out that the way KFW supported those funds is very different than the way the DFC did. And we'll be talking about those differences during the webinar. Uh, one thing that Michael didn't mention, I'm sure you know though, but threw me off, is that this is a 90-minute webinar. So they started on the half hour, so hopefully, um, so hopefully people don't drop off after the first hour, but um, no worries if you need to, uh, this webinar will be recorded. Uh, basically, it's about half the webinar will be uh, a panelist discussion, and then we'll try to use the other half to answer questions from our audience. There's no presentations, um, no slides besides the speaker slides. Uh, so I hope everyone is okay with that. So now I'd like to ask each panelist to give a short introduction of themselves, their organization and where they sit. And if it's okay, Anouk, can I start with you? Yes, that's totally fine. And uh, thank you for the invitation uh, to be here today. Uh, very nice and a very interesting topic. Uh, my name is Anouk Aert. I work for the uh, Dutch Ministry of Foreign Affairs. 
and uh, uh, within the Ministry of Foreign Affairs uh, for the Sustainable Economic Development Department. Uh, and our mandate is private sector development um, in developing countries. And um, within, the, within this very broad mandate, my focus is on financial inclusion and especially on uh, AGI finance. So we try to, um, to um, improve the access to finance uh, for farmers and agricultural uh, SMEs. Um, and uh, we do that in uh, many ways. I hopefully uh, I can uh, touch upon a few of them uh, later today. Uh, and I'm very much looking forward uh, to the conversation today. Thank you. Thank you, Anu. Uh, Peter? Hi, everybody. My name is Peter Beetz. I'm working in Switzerland for the Swiss Agency for Development Cooperation, a bilateral donor organization. I'm an economist. I'm working on topics like private sector engagement, private sector development, financial sector development, and things like this uh, for some 20 years. Um, I'm very excited to be on the panel. Thank you very much for having invited me. I think there's a lot of uh, new work to do, and lots of innovation needed uh, to, to, to get more money and more resources and more ideas into, into achievement of the SDGs. Thank you very much. Thank you, Peter. And Alexandra? Yes, hello. Thank you very much, Sungbi, for, for inviting me and for giving me the chance to, to be on this panel today. So my name is Alexandra Aladin. I, I joined KFW, the, the German Development Bank, some 20 years ago, so it's a long time. And I'm the agricultural finance team lead uh, in our equity and regional funds department. Um, and in this function, well, I'm, I'm overseeing the, the financing and structuring of, of many um, impact funds in the agri-space. Um, with a regional focus on Sub-Saharan Africa as well as Latin America. And apart from the agri-finance um, sector, I'm covering with my team um, climate risk insurance uh, projects as well, which is a very good value added to the agri-space, I think. And sometimes we can create um, linkages between the two sectors. Um, yes, apart from, from being uh, or having a team, at KFW, I'm also a member of the board of the Fair Trade Access Fund that was already mentioned by, by Songbi. So that's a very interesting position uh, to have as well. And while well, speaking shortly about KFW, I think, um, yeah, Songbi already introduced it as, as the, the German DFI. I think KFW is really kind of a strange animal within the DFI sphere since we have access to budgetary funds from the German government and thereby can give grants to, to other countries as well as loans and we can make investments into impact funds with our own money or by using um, budgetary funds. But this I will be covering later on as well. Um, yes, so I just stop here and hand back to, to Sungbi. Thank you. Thank you, Alexandra. And uh, it's great you're starting to get into some of the points we want to discuss because I do think it takes a while to kind of understand and absorb the differences between KFW and some of the other DFIs out there. I, I know that I was clearly aware of KFW in my previous job, but really myself did not even fully appreciate uh, how unique the organization is until we started preparing for this webinar. So now we're going to start off, and just to give you a broad idea of, of how I'm going to move, um, go forward, I'm going to ask specific questions um, to each of the panelists, and then I'm going to ask some general questions for the panelists before we go into the into the broader Q&A. So I'm going to start out with a nuke, and I'm going to talk, I'd like to talk about the words we use, and, and kind of referring back to your introduction, where you described that um, you work, the department you work in uh, focuses on private sector development. And I think that's something at USAID we'd call private sector engagement. And that financial inclusion falls under financial uh, private sector development. On the other hand, um, Peter mentioned to me before that his group, the high level goal is poverty reduction. And then fall, financial inclusion falls under, under that goal. So my, my question is, you know, how much difference does it make um, what we say, what we are describing? Is it, are we all doing the same work and just describing it differently? 
I don't know if uh, what your thoughts are on that, Anouk. Um, I think uh, in the end and in practice, it doesn't make any difference, right? Because uh, together with SDC, we're doing the same things. For example, uh, with Aseli, uh, and um, it's just how um, I think from a political perspective, we express ourselves and. Um, we, my department, we also, uh, the main goal of my department is also poverty reduction. Uh, but the way how we try to achieve this, uh, achieve this is through private sector development. So we believe if we can help the private sector develop and grow in developing countries, it will contribute to the GDP of a country and uh, it will also contribute to include all people in the society. Uh, in that process. Uh, so um, the end goal uh, for my department is inclusive economic growth in which everyone benefits from it. So I think that's the same goal as uh, SDC has in mind. Um, so I think in practice there are not much differences, maybe the political way how we uh, like to talk about that. I, I, I agree with that. I think that's a good thing to to point out that we are we are part of the government, so um, there's a political perspective. One thing, just to maybe peel back the the what is it the onion uh, one more layer is specifically around food security, and I think it's interesting because a lot of the work I do in our bureau is tied to private sector engagement. The title of our bureau includes food security, uh, but I know in our conversation, I think for you, food security is considered more of a public good. And I'm just wondering how, how you describe the difference, um, maybe what we describe as food security or, or how you guys look at food security. Um, yeah, we have a department that focuses on public goods like food security, but also like water and access to energy. Um, so the focus of the food security team is especially on the nutrition side of food security. Uh, but I think there's a lot of overlap between what they do and what we do. Actually, what the food security team of our ministry used to be in our team. So a few years ago, we were uh, uh, one big team and uh, then we split up. So um, where the overlap is, um, well, maybe not the overlap, but uh, the, from a private sector development angle, what we believe is that if we develop the um, agricultural sector, which is a very large sector in developing countries, it contributes a lot to the GDP of a country and a lot uh, to the employment within a country. We believe that we can give people jobs and income, uh, and with this income, people will be able to buy food. That's how my department uh, looks at food security from a private sector angle. Uh, but um, we also set criteria that um, the agricultural sector should um, grow crops in a sustainable manner, respecting uh, uh, the environment, uh, using the soil in a good way. And that's where the overlap with our food security team is, because they uh, want the same thing. Uh, and they also want to improve the nutrition uh, um, of the, uh, the crops that are being produced. So, um, yeah, that's the overlap. Thank you. And you know, I, and I think what this is making me realize is just it just makes it complicated, and it takes a while for people to understand who to talk to at an organization, and especially when different organizations are structured differently. And for our example, nutrition is led by our Global Health Bureau. Uh, and that's going to be more of a public good in, in health systems, whereas in the bureau in the bureau I work in, we also have nutrition center, and where we're trying to do more private sector engagement. Um, so, so thank you for that, and and uh, just realizing when we say private sector engagement, it, there's a there's a range of how much engagement we can have depending on the sector we're looking at, whether it's ag, wash, or nutrition. Um, I want to move on. Uh, to Alexandra and really um, talking about something you, you've already started um, addressing and how, what a unique animal KFW is as a DFI because they can take a first loss position uh, in, in investment funds. So I was just wondering if you can expand on that more, like why are you able to do that? Why do you think more DFIs 
don't do that when it's something I probably hear most consistently is the need for, for more first loss and for DFIs to take more risk. Yeah, thank you, uh, Sangbei. Um, so how, how should I start? I think really to start with our Ministry for, for Development Cooperation that is called BMZ, um, because BMZ um, can finance projects through either grants, uh, concessional loans, or commercial loans, or nearer to, to commercial terms. And this financing is done via KFW. So we are the, the agency or the institution for BMZ to, to do the financial cooperation. And therefore, we at KFW have access, access to budgetary funds from the ministry um, that we can invest into first loss tranches. So if we think about a, a ideal structured funds, uh, uh, a structured impact funds, it would consist of budgetary funds coming from the ministry, perhaps uh, another first loss piece coming from the EU, and then we would, would have KFW or DFI funds in, in kind of a mezzanine tranche, and then above that in the most senior part, we would have real private funds coming from the private sector. And this, um, well, this, this access to, to um, first loss money is, is something the ministry really wants because it wants to create bigger impact um, through leveraging private funds. So BMZ is absolutely aware um, that it takes a very high risk, but the ministry has always signaled us um, the leveraging of private funds is so important that our ministry is willing to take this risk because only by um, bringing in more private capital into development uh, cooperation, um, we can uh, start filling this huge, huge gap uh, that still exists and definitely cannot be tackled only uh, through budgetary funds and, and DFI monies. So therefore, um, the rationale behind taking this risk for, for our ministry is leveraging private funds is definitely as well um, acting as a, as a market maker um, and, and giving KFW the possibility to, to act as an anchor investor in these funds. And, and we all think that um, providing uh, money into a first loss tranche and thereby accepting that perhaps we will lose some of these monies can definitely have more impact than providing pure grants. And yeah, therefore, I mean, it's really, I don't think all DFIs have access to, to budgetary grants that can make loss, but that's the, the special situation of KFW. And I think, you know, it's interesting because I think of, we have large groups, donors, like USAID and DFIs like DFC, and then, I, starting to understand the differences between DFIs themselves becomes really important when you're looking for a partner. And uh, I think it's interesting that DFC only was able to do senior loans until a few years ago. Mm -hmm. And so now they, they can do equity. And it's we, we think about the products they can offer, but it's really interesting the buckets that you have, concessional mm -hmm. loans versus loans. So like, I think that that's an interesting perspective. Um, and the other thing is, I think we'll be re, um, Another question that will come up later is this idea, if you have both concessional loans and grants, which one would you use? But we'll put that in the parking lot for now. Um, I'd like to move on to, to Peter, and I'm gonna ask you one of the questions that um, a lot of people um, said they'd like to be have answered in the LinkedIn poll that I posted. And that is, should we work with large or small companies? And if I provided a little bit more, maybe, um, context to that question is a lot of times we want the smaller companies are the ones that need our help um, and but it's hard they find it challenging to scale the larger companies might have scale but they might not be as developmentally oriented as we'd like them to be so I don't know if you could talk from your experience and what your thoughts are on that topic okay I would like to uh, have the answer too. <laughs> um, we we are working at the moment. Uh, or we, what we did and started is working with social enterprises or impact enterprises, 
this is a, that's a subset of normal enterprises where they are more aligned with our objectives. Our objectives are political, poverty reduction, reduction of inequality, um, achieving the SDGs, you know the story. Uh, so we really have to look with whom we are working uh, for reputational reason, reasons and for transaction costs, not explaining uh, all the time what we want, uh, what we can pay for, and where we can provide grants and subsidies for. So it's it's easier in principle to work with this kind of enterprises, and these tend to be smaller, um, which is, is a problem. Uh, they are aligned, that's an, a big advantage. They want the same thing. Perhaps social enterprises usually want um, uh, the, the social impact first, fantastic. But if you want to go to scale, then, then it's a little bit more complicated. There are not so many huge uh, or big uh, important ones out there. And being commercially successful is sometimes a conflict of interest. If you go to rural areas, if you sell your products at a price that poor people can afford, then you're not that profitable and so on and so forth. So I think there is a, still a good reason to work with this kind of enterprises because they are closer to our target groups, uh, working more directly with them. But the more I see, the more I learn, I think we should try as well working with bigger companies and try to transform them, uh, bring them uh, closer down to the base of the pyramid, to the bottom of the pyramid, uh, develop project, uh, products and services where they can earn money uh, with, uh, with poor people uh, and providing uh, uh, something good for them. Uh, that's, of course, a little bit more complicated, but I think we are learning in, in tackling finance how to do this, and, and uh, I think we need to test a little bit more. Uh, uh, I think that's a challenge. So um, you, you can do both, uh, and uh, you always have to think in terms of transaction costs. Uh, we have very small donor. SDC is a very small donor. Okay. Uh, we have little money, uh, but, but still we have to be very conscious where we can put it. Uh, so maybe you have to go in a bigger company that when, then works with lots of smaller companies and you just work with the big company and they work with the smaller companies. So these these are all considerations that come into play if you think about this question. Two, two follow-up questions to that, Peter. Um, one is the, what you think of larger, just to be a little clearer, sometimes you know USA partners with large multinational corporations, but I think when you say larger, you're not making that big leap from small to multinational? That's the first question, what do you mean by large? And second, this was also a question that came up from a, a link, the LinkedIn comment from Mumbi from Agra, and it's related to your question about the larger companies and, and your definition working with smaller companies. Can you, is that providing services, technical assistance, or, or mainly financing, value chain financing from the larger companies to the smaller companies? The, uh, well, every country has its definitions about what small, medium, and big is. Uh, when we talk about big, uh, uh, huge would be multinational corporations. And, and um, yes, there can be interesting partners, of course, too. I imagine you can convince a, a multinational company in one country to become more social, more inclusive, uh, more oriented versus the poor, and then they replicate it uh, themselves in the other uh, 200 countries where they are active. That would be, of course, a fantastic uh, outreach and system change. Uh, but I think this is particularly difficult because they are not waiting for a small donor like SDC. Uh, we try this from time to time. I think a few things worked, uh, but it's, it's particularly difficult. So if I talk about large, I would rather go into the direction, as you said, uh, uh, from the, uh, uh, those that are then dealing with others. Uh, 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 an investor can be a large company if they are providing uh, loans to lots of SMEs, agro-processing as, as SMEs, exporter SMEs, buyers, all this kind of thing. That can be then large uh, multiplier, a catalyst that helps you reach out to more SMEs, who then themselves are then reaching out to uh, our final target group, smallholder farmers, for instance. Yeah, I, and I agree with a lot of that. And I think the challenge there is we can keep getting farther away from maybe the ultimate target group we want, these smallholder farmers, and it's harder to describe what that connection is or measuring what the, uh, what the impact will be. Um, I'm going to ask another round of questions now where we're going to focus a little bit more on the specific activities that you support, and I'll go back to you, Alexandra. So KFW has supported a wide range of financial intermediaries in the agricultural space, and I was wondering if you could highlight a couple of them and describe how they fit in your past strategy, as well as how they inform the work that you plan on doing going forward. 
Yes, it's, um, I think it's, it's really right to distinguish between a past and, and a current strategy. Because when we started creating um, or financing impact funds in the agri space, as well as uh, doing direct investments, it was based on, on this rationale that we wanted to, to directly improve the living conditions of smallholders. And we, we kind of established a model disaggregating the agricultural market in, into eight primary segments. And then we really had producers on the one hand side or left hand side and value chain businesses on the right hand side divided each into four segments uh, starting from subsistence farmers so the very small holders with just one acre or less and and then coming to really medium large companies or, or uh, commercial farmers sorry just um contributing to to what what peter just said and then on, on the value chain businesses, again, we had the micro businesses and then uh, at the other end, the, the very huge, large businesses. And it, with our strategy, we kind uh, or we, we try to, to establish or to, to create funds and direct investments suitable for, for nearly each of the sectors. Of course, not for the large businesses on the value chain businesses, as well as for the large commercial farmers, but for other segments. And for example, we, we started financing one acre fund and my agro to really address the subsistence farmers or on the business side, we, we created ARTIF, which is one of our flagship agricultural funds that was then handing out big loans uh, to, to medium-sized enterprises of, of a couple of million dollars. Um, and then we kind of realized how, how labor intensive that is and that perhaps the, the cost benefit ratio for KPW itself uh, is not the right one anymore. And especially when it came to these direct equity investments, we realized that it's, it can't be done by a by a KFW itself, but it should be pooled into into a special fund. And then we created the Social Enterprise Fund uh, for Africa last year. So now we want to to try to to do investments into social enterprises through a specific fund uh, and not ourselves anymore. And therefore, that led to to our new strategy, and we created a new strategy as well since we. As, as a bank, we pooled all the, the funds and direct equity business uh, into one department. And as a department, we, we started a new strategy and said, well, we, we don't want to do boutique funds or investments anymore, but really concentrate on the larger investments. Um, the rationale behind that being that um, bigger funds can, can attract more private monies. And, and this is something we definitely want to do. And um, when it comes to agri-finance, we think we cannot address through the impact funds so well anymore the, the smallholders itself, but that should be done only indirectly. But for KFW now, we want to concentrate on funds that have a really unique selling proposition that they come um, come that drive innovation and, and combine uh, certain topics like um, food security, we already mentioned that, with climate change adaption. So therefore, we, we really have moved away a little bit from the smallholder itself, because we think this should be more done via grants, for example, um, yeah, through organizations like One Acre Fund, which is not a fund or an impact fund, but an NGO. And with, with our expertise, we concentrate on impact funds that, that address uh, more specific uh, areas in the food production and agricultural sector. So there was a long answer. <laughs> no, that was very helpful. Thank you, Alexandra. You know, the last point you're making, I'm just wondering, so is there a distinction between saying that moving away from smallholder farmers, um, which require that type of activity requires grants, or are you saying that you know you're going to be reaching them in a different way? I think you're saying the first thing that you're you're going to be working in a different area. I think it's it's really both. 
um, it's still providing grants um, more probably through the bilateral cooperation via um, more governmental or NGO um, organizations. And then on the impact fund side, I think we are still reaching out to, uh, to smallholders, but not in a direct way anymore, but only so I mean, when we start uh, financing uh, SMEs in Africa via, via an impact fund, then these SME will still um, buy products and crops from smallholders. And of course, we, we really pay a lot of attention that in the investment strategy of these funds, it's, it's really written down that um, products should be, should be uh, bought from, from smallholders in the surroundings. Um, to to create impact uh, in this uh, area as well. Yeah, and I think that is a trend I've seen. I mean, to, I think it's a very similar trend to what the question we discussed with Peter about large companies, large funds, yeah. um, a, a little bit more indirect support for the smallholder farmers. So, I mean, Peter, I mean, I think like the idea maybe more specifically is that your your goal is for poverty reduction, and uh, are we saying now we can do poverty reduction by working potentially with larger larger companies versus working directly with smallholder farmers through a through an organization like One Acre Fund? Or are we now doing something different? Is that just a different approach or is it actually a different goal? Uh, wait, wait, wait. If we are working with One Acre Fund, um, it's via One Acre Fund that then you reach out to smallholder farmers, okay? So that your intermediary is a one acre fund and perhaps even subcontractors. If you work if, uh, via an investment fund that then provides money for small and medium enterprises that then work with smallholder farmers, it's just a layer, additional layer, but it's still indirect. We, we almost never are able to, to work directly uh, with, with smallholder farmers. We are too small, we are too, too, too little people. Uh, we have to subcontract almost everything. We are sitting in our offices and headquarters or in capitals. We are not directly working with smallholder farmers. We are not doing contracts. We are not doing technical assistance ourselves. We always have to find an efficient way with uh, the, the best intermediary, the best structure of intermediaries. Perhaps it's one or two or three. It depends on the case and on the on the sector. And I think, uh, yeah, when we talked about our CD or we're talking about our CD one acre fund. These are intermediaries, aggregators, catalysts that help us reach our final target groups. Yeah, and I think it's going to be the challenges on us. I think first to be clear, I think the points that you know Alexander is making that it is we might be working with a different group, but then to your point, Peter, it's up to us to be able to describe how it's still benefiting or our goal. The, the smallholders eventually. Um, I want to go back to you, Anouk, and um, it's, um, talk about a specific transaction that we are both in, the Farm Fit Fund that's managed by IDH. And this, for us, was a very big deal. It was the largest now DFC uh, guarantee ever committed, and MFA is an investor in, in the fund itself. So I was wondering if you could tell I know you didn't work directly on this. This is covered by a colleague, but just if you could share some background about why MFA decided to support the Farm Fit Fund. And, and second, anything you can add about what I think is very unique that the other investors in the fund are multinational corporations. Yes. Yes, thank you. And um, yes, indeed, we are uh, um, uh, supporting the uh, Farm Fit Fund. And um, we... Uh, oh, that's uh, part of our support to IDH, uh, its core business. And uh, we are very supportive of IDH and the Farm Fit Fund because they have expertise in uh, making value chains uh, more sustainable and to include the smallholders into the value chain. And, um, and um, their expertise, uh, they have specific expertise in specific value chains like coffee, cacao, and um, cotton, for example. Um, and their focus is also, uh, therefore, on the uh, commodity sides of these value chains, um, but also on all the players in the value chain. Because before your question, um, Alexandra and Peter, you discussed around should we support small companies or large companies or uh, what is the best thing to do? Uh, our philosophy is that we should do it all. I mean, we need to give smallholders access to credits, ideally via the local banks. 
Uh, but if the SMEs that are surrounding the smallholders do not have access to credit, we need to give them access to credit as well. And the same goes for at the multinational level, the, the off-takers, um, if there are obstacles in the value chain uh, that make it for them uh, more complicated to uh, get the value chain operational, we need to tackle that. And uh, we can do that uh, with IDH technical assistance, but we can also do that with the farm fit funds uh, that can tackle the issues around the financial inclusion side, whether it's at the farmer level, the off-taker level, or somewhere else. Uh, we should, should think of innovative ways uh, to tackle the finance problem, no matter at which level it occurs. And um, depending on the level of the financing issue, um, FarmFit is able to um, involve the right party. So um, at the SME level, uh, there are organizations uh, like Aceli, for example, who can step into that space. But if there's a uh, financing problem uh, where we don't have financial instruments for, then we feel that FarmFit um, is able and very well positioned uh, to come up with uh, an innovative solution to make the entire value chain operational. And uh, we believe that the investor base is extremely interesting in that sense because they have investors like coffee producers, but also Rabobank is an investor and a few more uh, big multilateral um, multinational uh, corporations. We don't have any other uh, access to finance instruments with these kind of investors. And that's what also makes FarmFit unique, that the um, investors themselves are active in these value chains. So there's a lot of cost learnings um, to achieve. Thank you, Anouk. You know, one thing I, you know, I realized um, that I don't highlight enough is the fact that, right, IDH, the FarmFit Fund, does have, it's part of the IDH family, which has all that experience and work that they do in value chains. Um, it does make it a little confusing to understand which parts do what. So IDH, the management company, is part of, I think, IDH, the organization, but they are separate um, as a professional fund manager. But they clearly work closely together. I know one of their first investments in Chicoa the fish, uh, the aquaculture company in Mozambique had had assistance, a technical assistance provided by IDH, the not the fund manager, and then IDH, the fund manager, came in with an investment. So that's very. I'm glad you highlighted that. It does. It even makes it difficult for me to understand who is doing what, but but important to mention. And the part about multinational corporations, I think I, I I've seen in my short time different different ways that they can interact. I think the most traditional one I see is that they give a grant. Um, like I think uh, Keurig has given a grant to Root Capital um, to do some of the work they do with smallholder, uh, smallholder farmers. And then I think a second, a second way um, is where they're actually an implementer themselves. And I think the one I just would highlight is Neumann, Neumann Coffee Group, which was the, the precursor fund that was the blueprint for the FarmFit Fund. But then in the FarmFit Fund, you have the multinational corporation as an investor themselves. So I, I just think that it's it's really interesting and nice to see the different ways that um, corporates are being uh, are being involved with our work. I want to uh, go back to Peter, and there's a there's an um, an activity that's been mentioned several times, a Sally Africa. Um, now, I don't want it's a it's an it's an interesting program. It's not lending, Aceli does not lend to SMEs. I'm not going to ask you to explain it. Besides, I'm just going to say it's a market incentive facility that works with existing lenders. But the question I have about Aceli is that it's an area that uh, SDC, MFA, and USAID all support. So I'm wondering, do you think of that as a good thing or a bad thing? And what I mean by that, it's a good thing that I think, I always think we should work more closely together. On the other hand, sometimes you'll hear that, you know, we're crowding into something that's a, a donor darling and, and overlooking other, other innovative out, ideas out there that also need our funding and support. 
in this specific case, I think it's a very good uh, thing that we are collaborating. And uh, Alexander, please join. <laughs> Anug is already there. <laughs> Uh, um, because uh, for size matters in this case, and uh, they, they have really a fantastic model, and they're working regional. And I think we all can contribute beyond just giving money and coordinating and strategic advice, blah, blah. It's in the policy dialogue that we can make a big difference and support them. So if you have four, three, five donors, you have um, uh, four or five different teams with connections different connections to the government, to um, to development banks, to the World Bank, uh, to whoever is having a, a say in policy dialogue. And um, uh, what Arsenia is, is out going to do is to show with their results that this is a very efficient way to support smallholder farmers in agriculture. And uh, you can even go for agroecology, what they try. Uh, so they can design the sub uh, subsidies to the to the to the objective you want, and, and now it's our objectives, but it could be the the ones of the states. Or they should be aligned, by the way. Uh, and and then if uh, three four donors are uh, sitting around the table and pushing uh, uh, for 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 getting the state interested to step in and take this over in the long run. Uh, that I think that's perfect. So there we can make a huge difference in terms of system change and, and, and long-term sustainability. Because, uh, as you said, it's not investing; it's uh, catalyzing investment. It's grant money. It needs to be replenished uh, always uh, because they are they are helping uh, to repair a market failure. So yes, in this case, I think that's very good that we are all together in it, and there should be more. Uh, and that would then allow us to go to more countries and, and replicate this in, in other countries as well, uh, where, where the, the context is, is good. That would be my short answer. And you yeah, can ask this... Brian Milder, he's there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, you know, I think the important, like, the part I'd highlight is that I think sometimes when we support uh, an impact fund or a blended finance fund, that we just think it needs subsidy when it starts, and then we hope it will become self-sustainable in the future. This is a case where we help, we hope to reduce the amount of subsidy we need by becoming more efficient, but we don't expect it to go away anytime in the near term. So I think that, so that's the first point, but the second point you touched on, the goal of a CELI is to work with local governments and have them eventually adopt the same approach once that the model has Develop the data and proven its approach, and I and I never appreciated, and it'll be interesting to see how it works out. That when we have you know multiple donors coming in and be able to help uh, facilitate those discussions, um, that that would be um, a pretty big impact as well. I want to um, oh, Peter. I also wanted you to touch on uh, another activity that I've learned of that SDC supports Think, and I get confused myself how it's similar or different to a CELI. So I was wondering if you could just do an introduction of SYNC, what it is, and, and how it is similar or different. And I, I think you've also, not to confuse things even more, I hear you, I've heard it compared more to development impact bonds more than I have to a market incentive facility. So I don't know if you can give us a quick primer. Okay, um, so um, SYNC was inspired by social or development impact bonds. Uh, we, we thought, I, I personally think this is a really brilliant idea, uh, paying for outcomes, uh, capitalizing investments, uh, lots of things in this direction. But when I, I looked in more detail in the social and development impact bonds, I, I discovered that this is highly complicated. You need to set up a special purpose vehicle that takes a long time until everybody's around the table. Uh, so lots of complications uh, far, far away when you finally have impact. Uh, so we thought, can't we do this more simple and cut out a few layers? And then we said, yes, uh, we could do so. We could agree with the social enterprise or the impact enterprise or with any enterprise on uh, that we will pay for a certain impact. We say what we what we want to define as an impact, and we we talk about the price we will would be willing uh, to pay for it. In, in the end, we are we are buying kilograms or tons or whatever you want of impact and are paying five hundred or thousand dollars for it. So that's very simple. So you sit together with a social entrepreneur. You say if you go to a very rural area or you serve more for people, more for people or you work with more smallholder farmers, or you do this and that, or you be more inclusive in gender, 
or you are better in agroecology, uh, you're using better methods, you use less pesticides, you choose the objective, then I'm going to pay you for this. And I'm doing this only under the condition that it is additional. That's my job. I'm not paying for what you're doing anyway. I want you to, to do you something in addition to what you were doing before. And that is usually um, in terms of outreach and more impact. This comes with an investment. As we all know, we need uh, money to grow our business and our, uh, yeah, you just need more money. And we say, you get this money under the condition that what you do is additional. We can verify it. And of course, you have an investor. And the function of the investor is not only providing the money, it's helping as well the donor um, to feel comfortable about the business he doesn't know. Uh, because they do a due diligence, they are not risking their money for something which is not going to fly. They have a look at our paper we produced with a social entrepreneur, whether this can be really produced, uh, this impact as well, not only the products, but the impact as well, so they get the payment and everything. So that's uh, the simple uh, explanation of SYNC. You have two parties, an outcome payer, a social enterprise. You agree on KPIs, uh, key performance indicators, uh, for and how much you're going to pay for impact. With this contract under the arm, the uh, investee goes to the investor and says, please uh, give me a little bit of money, equity loan, whatever, I don't care, as long as they grow and it's additional. So that, that's the, the very simple case. And what Aseli did, they applied it to uh, smallholder, uh, uh, sorry, uh, agri-SME finance uh, in the missing middle. So uh, they cracked, from, from my point of view, they cracked the nut. Uh, uh, that was done uh, by Brian Milder. He's, he's listening. And the first uh, deal we did was with Root Capital. We tried this and, and we saw it worked. It is providing to the lender um, the money he's usually lo losing when he's working in the missing middle. It's about $20,000 per deal. So I'm not going to give a loan to a small cooperative in Guatemala if I'm losing $20,000. Why should I? I can't, I can't do this forever. Uh, it's not working. So it's not happening. That's why we have the missing middle. So uh, by paying the lender these 20000 it works. He can do it. He's not losing money. We have additional impact. Nobody else would give uh, money to them. It's at the missing middle. So that was the initial idea. And I see it. And they realized it's not only about the sink payment. It's about technical assistance as well. It's about uh, taking risks. Um, you know, uh, it's difficult. There are country risks. There are political risks. There are, um, there are uh, currency risks. So um, investors shy away for a lot of reasons not to invest in the companies we think that can provide the impact uh, we want to see. So lending to smallholder farmers, paying SIG is fine. But not sufficient. You need uh, as well uh, technical assistance and some kind of risk in, uh, risk covering uh, coverage. Uh, maybe all three, maybe just one. Uh, they packaged it, and that's uh, uh, very brilliant from my point of view. And if this works, and it seems to work, they have already a lot of results, uh, and we can convince the state to come in. Uh, then it's uh, then it's really a success. So uh, that's what I like very much about Aseli. They took this idea of sync. They use it already. They apply it. Uh, they, you can apply it as you want. You can say, I'm paying more for gender inclusion. I'm paying more for uh, agroecology. Uh, and they combine it with uh, what, what else is needed to, uh, to make this happen in this special market, uh, this special and extremely difficult market uh, where nobody wants to let or, or it's, it's uh, the, the last moment where people let. So that's the difference between sync and uh, uh, progression, thanks to Hasidi. Thank you, Peter. And um, so if people didn't catch it, SYNC is S-I-I-N-C, and it stands for Social Impact Incentives. So if folks want to, I know he called it a simple explanation, but it is. it does take a little while, I think, to understand because it is, it, it is fairly innovative. Okay, we're going to, I know um, I'm going to ask a few more questions, uh, and then we're going to go into, um, I'm going to um, start looking at the questions popping in. So sorry if I look distracted, but um, I did the question you mentioned, you started uh, teasing it up, Peter, about technical assistance. And, you know, this is maybe, I'm gonna direct this to prepare you a nuke to start out with the first, but the question is technical assistance or first loss? And this was by far the most popular uh, question on my LinkedIn poll. And so let's, you know, there's, from a donor's perspective, you know, we have the option of uh, first loss or technical assistance as, as some of our choices. I was wondering, do you think we should be, are we doing, should we be doing more of one or the other versus how much we're doing today? 
Um, it's not an easy question to answer in that way, um, yet it's also a simple question because um, if we can uh, do it, if we can uh, give farmers access to finance just with technical assistance, why not? Uh, I mean, we have an organization uh, that supports um, farmer cooperatives. Uh, they help strengthen the farmer cooperatives. And this organization is called uh, Agriterra. So they provide technical assistance to the cooperative and helps them uh, build a good governance structure within the cooperative um, and a good financial management, these kind of things. And uh, the result of their uh, technical assistance in the end is that the farmers are going to contribute more to the cooperative uh, financially. So um, the cooperative becomes a richer uh, entity and the cooperative then is uh, much better able to go to a local bank and access credit from a local bank because the, the cooperative can tell the bank, look, our farmers are contributing to the cooperative and we want to build a plant and we want to have a loan from you, uh, local bank. And uh, this uh, model has proven to be very successful. They call it the internal capitalization strategy. And that is in my view, the most powerful intervention uh, that exists, right? Because then you have the cooperative in its full power to go to a local bank and access credit from a local bank. So they don't need first loss guarantees anymore. And um, so in uh, these examples, um, I would say if we can do it just with technical assistance, let's just do that. And um, when you go to smallholders um, who are not uh, organized in a cooperative, it might become more difficult. And um, they, for example, have difficulties getting access to credit from a local bank, perhaps we should ask FMO, our development bank then, or Aseli to help the local bank with um, conditional loans, for example, extra capital, so that the smallholder farmer can get access to finance from the local bank, uh, because it's being backed up by Aseli or by FMO. Um, in that case, that could also be a good solution. So it depends a little bit on how uh, um, how the approach is. But uh, technical assistance alone could be uh, as powerful as a first loss. Thank you, Anouk. And maybe I'll, I'll ask Alexandra either to respond to Anouk's comments or to just maybe um, give your perspective as, as a DFI, considering that you can do grants uh, or, or concessional loans. And I think you kind of indicated earlier what your preference would be. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. I think they, they, well, for me, it's definitely not an either or question. And I absolutely agree with all the, the points Anouk mentioned um, in favor of, of technical assistance. I think technical assistance is key to so many investments. And uh, yeah, we are doing and, and impacts we want to achieve. So absolutely agree to, to what you said, uh, Anouk. I think then perhaps to, to make an additional point, we should um, include the investment offices or credit offices in MFIs as well in this technical assistance approach, because I think often um, loans to smallholders are not being handed out because the, the risk uh, um, assessment can't be done uh, through the credit officers or they just don't feel comfortable uh, with the, the the risk environment they are facing in, in the agri space. Um, but then, of course, I think um, the financing gap within the, the agri space is still so huge that we cannot only concentrate on TA, but we need the first loss pieces to to attract investment from from the private sector to de-risk uh, these investments um, to more on the on the business side or the company side um, and this can be done very very well by using um, first loss pieces and one last thing i want to mention i think when we want to enable more innovations to take place 
again, the de-risking factor is huge, and and we definitely need innovations in the in the agri space, in the in the food market uh, as well, and therefore. I would definitely opt for for both. And while well, we have Cape W, we are in this lucky um, situation that we can really offer um, first loss pieces um, together with uh, grants for for TA facilities. On that point, there was a question also on uh, um, from the LinkedIn post from Kaylin Fraser, EBRD. Uh, these blended finance structures that have a uh, first loss piece that are combined often with technical assistance. Do we get to a point where there's too much subsidy? Uh, or do, are we worried about that, that there's so, we have subsidy both on the fund side, on the technical assistance side, combining that, how do we know if, if that's the most efficient use? Yeah, that's a good one. I think um, we already started, or in, in many approaches, we, we although talk to the fund managers and, and other um, market players, if, if the TA should always come as a grant or if people should pay for, for the TA. Um, and then that brings me back to, to One Acre Fund again. It's really funny that this example comes up so often, but One Acre Fund did exactly that, although working with smallholders, they did not give the TA as a, as a grant, but they asked the, the smallholders to pay for the technical assistance they received. And I don't know if you have kids, but when I was a kid, I, I had to pay for my driving license myself. And I really uh, took care that I would never ever lose this driving license. And um, I think same with TA, if it's just handed out as a grant and, and you don't pay for it, they, you don't see the value as much as when you have to pay for it. So um, is it, I think this could be one, one um, way of, of addressing this issue of too much subsidy. Um, but then again, um, yeah, well, I stick to my point that the first loss tranche in, in structured funds should only be used to really attract a lot of, of private money coming in. And then um, depending from the leverage ratio you have, the, the subsidy is not that huge anymore. Um, of course, in the agri space, I have done some calculations uh, in our impact investment funds in the agri space, the, the leverage ratio is only one to two. But in other sectors like renewables or so, uh, we sometimes see see leverage ratios of one to eight or even even higher. So um, I think it's, it's yeah, no. we definitely have to be careful that we, we kind of don't over subsidize our investments, but yeah, there are ways to, to tackle it. I think, and this is the last question I was gonna ask the group and you already started answering it and it's the leverage question. So leverage is something that comes up every time I'm involved in um, discussing a finance activity. And my question is, uh, what's the difference between maximizing impact and maximizing leverage? Um, do we focus too much on maximizing leverage because it's too difficult to, me uh, to measure the impact? And is there a case where there's too much leverage? And so Peter, I know uh, Alexandra has already um, mentioned some leverage targets that she, uh, leverage results she's seen. I was wondering if you can comment on some of these other questions about leverage. Well, concerning leverage, I think this is uh, the wrong metrics. Uh, it's, for us, it's all about impact. We want impact and there's some nice additional information that may be leveraged, but uh, it very much depends on the case. And our our experience up to now is uh, that the leverage factor beyond 10 is suspicious. Um, why would anybody invest into a company, uh, let's say with a leverage effect of 100 or 1000 that some, some, some people claim, uh, where um, Swiss taxpayers money is $1 and the others put in 99. Uh, are they putting the money in because we are putting one one dollar in it? Is this uh, saving them, helping them? Um, if the leverage is too high, it will be just windfall. Uh, so I think um, uh, that's that's not realistic. Then we are not really needed. 
so we are usually working in contexts uh, where we need a lot of subsidy, a high element of subsidy, because otherwise nobody would go there. In, in, in very poor countries, in very rural areas, in, uh, not into Indonesia and Brazil and South Africa, uh, that's where investors go anyway. If, if they would go there, then we would try to uh, help them go into more rural areas, more difficult areas, and then we would need again high subsidy. We want them to go in sectors where others don't go, where nobody goes then it needs subsidy and then it's one to one or one to two or one to five if we are lucky and one to ten in huge in, in extremely successful intelligence schemes but beyond i think it's just windfall and it's not additional that's my personal opinion thank you peter i don't know if anyone if anu could like to add to that or we can go to uh some of the questions from the chat maybe one quick remark on that because um, if what I'm always, I always find very interesting are the reports from Convergence, and uh, they show that in the agricultural sector the leverage ratio is very low. So there's um, really just a very little amount of private capital flowing into the agricultural uh, um, space, um, and that is because of I think all the obstacles at the smallholder level and the access to credit, which is not uh, operational over there. So. Uh, in the agricultural space, I think we have not reached the point yet that we can say there's too much leverage or too much private capital. I wish we could. <laughs> Thank you for that. And the other thing I've heard about the convergence report is that it includes that leverage even if it um, includes DFI funding. And I think sometimes that's described as a negative thing. And from my perspective, it's not. I think. It's natural for us as a donor to first crowd in a DFI who's going to be the more developmentally focused capital before you can get a, a more commercial, more private sector a lender to be part of it. So I'm going over, let's see, the first question I see here um, is from Petra Schmitter, and I'll read, paraphrase it. So first loss guarantee set up aim to unlock private sector investment often skewed towards large international companies as small SMEs often lack the capacity to apply. How easy is it to roll this out for small SMEs in Africa? I, I, I think this would be a great question for Brian to answer, milder from, from a Sally Africa. But um, so I'll ask one of our um, panelists to answer that, Anouk or, or Peter, would you like to, to answer that, either using a CELI as an example or, or, or something else? So the basically is a lot of these programs are for large international companies. How can we have them uh, help smaller SMEs? I can have a try. Um, when we provide usually a first loss uh, guarantee or first loss piece, um, it's it's not directly to the smallholder. It's it's to an investment fund, a structured fund with three layers: uh, first loss piece, and normally a second uh, uh, a B share, and in the end an A share, B share by development uh, company, and, and A share by by private investors. It's, it's to incentivize uh, that they they take this kind of risks. That it uh, and then the structured fund lends on to a local. Uh, somebody locally and who lends onto the SME. That's how it works. It's never directly to a small and medium enterprise. Uh, so uh, that, that would be my part of the answer to this question. And de-risking needs to be done at the level of the investors. Well, Nuke, I'm going to ask you to talk maybe a little bit more directly about Aseli, because there's another question from Jennifer King, who said she'd like to hear about how grant mechanisms are designed to positively positively impact women smallholder farmers in particular. So there's a gender aspect, which again I think you can use a Sally as an example uh, or other examples um, that you'd like. Uh, yes, um, that we can talk uh, for a long time about the gender uh, gender aspects around financial inclusion, especially in the agricultural sector. I think. Um, Technical assistance uh, could be used, for example, uh, in a CELI context um, around innovations for um, innovations that help female get access to credit, for example. 
very often females have more difficulties uh, in this than men because they don't uh, have uh, lands. Uh, very often the land is uh, owned by uh, the males instead of the females. So if uh, the innovation element of Aceli finds a nice way to um, give access to credits uh, to females without providing land as a collateral, for example, then that would be a very nice use of uh, technical assistance uh, to achieve gender equality. Another example could be uh, training on financial literacy for females. Um, and uh, sometimes you even need to um, organize daycare for the children, uh, for the females to have them actually uh, join these trainings because nobody else would look after the children if this is not organized. So there are a lot of elements that uh, come into play here um, to achieve gender equality. But I think the collateral piece is uh, most important to solve that because men have more collateral than females. Thank you, Anouk. And I, I, I'll just add, you know, to the part about how we make sure we're targeting smaller SMEs. So Aceli Africa has a, a maximum limit of their loan size, uh, about one, $1 1.5, $1.75 million. So they, they don't give larger loan sizes to that because they are targeting the missing middle that cannot access capital. So that's one way they do that. Another way that Aceli Africa targets women in general is that the incentives they provide to the local lenders are higher when those loans are made to SMEs that have a gender component. Um, I think a, um, I wanted to ask a question actually that came in um, over LinkedIn before, and it's the role of international funds. And, and Alexandra, you know, we've been talking about why KFW supports some of these funds. I was wondering if you could address more specifically about their role in relation to local lenders. Are international funds expected, you know, is this just a group by itself and we will always have them? Or for the way we think about them, are they specifically here to de-risk a market so that local banks can, can follow afterwards? And I was wondering if how much of that is part of your thinking or not. So when you say international funds, uh, it would be regional funds in, in my wording probably. Yes, like I'm sorry. Any, funds, any funds yeah. that's uh, not a local commercial bank. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, I think and we have kind of uh, talked about that already a lot. Um, yeah, what's exactly the role of this regional uh, funds or some funds are acting even on a global level. And I think it's, it's, it's kind of to create additionality to, to what the local banks can offer. And, and they're always the the aspect of de-risking uh, should play a role. Plus, um, so I think it's de-risking or entering into especially risky markets and um, creating innovations. This for me would be the, the two main add-ons or, or additional aspects uh, regional funds should be playing. And then, um, of course, the, the local market still plays a crucial role. And um, when uh, regional funds or impact investment funds are, are used um, to, to provide credit lines to local MFIs, this should always be done with a, um, under a certain uh, theme like, uh, yeah, we just had the, the gender or talked about the gender aspect. So that there could be a, a a credit line focused on gender aspects, a, focused, a credit line focused on, on innovative young enterprises, a credit line focused on, on climate uh, change investments. So I think, uh, yeah, it's, it's not a, the, there should not be um, a competition between regional funds and, and the local uh, banking market, but, but always, yeah, this, this uh, cooperation mostly. And I, and I agree with that. I, I do see from my own experience that a lot of attention is placed on international funds, but I think a lot of it is um, because of the reasons you described. I also, I think most people would agree that the local banks, you know, are going to be eventually where the scale comes from because of all the capital mm -hmm. and the local context that they have. I, I, I'm, I'm sounding the, like a, the, the, 
the impact funds really um, need the local market to to distribute their their credit lines. Otherwise, I mean, because uh, an impact investment funds doesn't have customer itself, but they are really dependent on the on the local banking market or financial market on the MFIs in in the countries itself. Yeah. I and I think it's interesting, I, I make an analogy to microfinance, which is the sector I covered previously, that you had all these international specialized funds making loans to microfinance institutions, MFIs, and then eventually a lot of these MFIs would get funding locally from local banks. But that didn't mean that these uh, large microfinance, international microfinance funds went away. They, it was just the local banks become another source of capital and, and probably a larger source as a percentage over, over time. Um, I want to ask um, a question about, about data, and this is, um, we kind of touched on it, um, you know, partly was the cost of, of combining technical assistance with the blended finance facility. Hedwig from Agra, you know, asked a similar question, what is the real cost of blended finance funds when you kind of think of all these other intangibles, the time spent on staff and the design? Uh, my question is taking that and saying, we have, we collect a lot of impact data on individual activities or funds. Is there any work that you can think of that would help us um, measure, you know, compare two different act blended finance activities to say which ones we should put, which, which one should we put first loss in or which one should we uh, provide, you know, fund technical assistance sidecar? How, how can we approach that? I mean, to your, like to, to Peter's point earlier, we shouldn't be measuring leverage, but that that's that's the easy number to calculate. If we me, if we measure something on just on a particular activity, how do we compare that to another activity? Can I answer on this one? Sure, please. <laughs> um, uh, I would come with cost benefit analysis, and uh, the benefit is. Uh, the impact we want to achieve. It's not about leverage. We're not going to leverage. It's just a means to an end. Money is just a means to an end. What we want to have is improving smallholders' livelihoods. And uh, with cost-benefit or cost-effectiveness, uh, you are forced to at least have an idea as, uh, and try to get as close as possible what is happening at the level of your ultimate beneficiaries, the smallholder farmers in this case. So uh, whenever you have an idea what is happening in their livelihood before and after the project, then you know whether you're on a good way or not. You can call it cost effectiveness, cost benefit analysis, whatever. Uh, but you have to make sure that the cost you're putting in is uh, at least paying out uh, for the smallholder farmers or multiple of this. Uh, that, that, that's the thing. And based on this, then you can distinguish whether it's perhaps better to give a first loss piece or technical assistance or uh, risk guarantee or paying for outcomes or impacts, uh, I think uh, that would be the, uh, the best answer. Does anyone like to uh, add a comment? Yeah, I think what um, what's very helpful is when you start uh, with baseline studies at the, at the very beginning, because only then you can make uh, comparisons years after your investment, and we we started that with uh, with Artif and used some of the the TA monies to to conduct these baseline studies, and then we have a chance, like three or four years after a certain investment has been done, to really evaluate and assess uh, the impact of of this investment. But I have to admit, it's it's very cost incentive, and the question one could ask is. Is, is team A money really the, the right source uh, to, to fund these baseline studies? Um, but yeah, so far uh, it was the only source and uh, I think it's, it's still money well invested, but um, yeah, it's, it's extremely uh, labor and, and cost incentive intensive. Yeah, I Data mean, one needs thing to come from the investee. The data needs to come from the SMEs or from the, the, the companies that, that are doing it. They, they know their customers, mm. they should know them, and that's where you should get the data from. Uh, you should have them install a proper management system and get yeah. all of them from them the, the money. And then you are, from time to time, you need to be pragmatic. We all know that a small owner is not going to tell you or doesn't even know what he made uh, as profit last year and what he will uh, have as a profit this year. 
So you always have to estimate this. And the best is if you know from the cooperative you're giving the money to a loan to, they know how much they bought from this smallholder farmer. So you have an indicator. It's gross revenue. Okay, good. But it gives, it gives you an indication. And then perhaps with the additional intelligence, uh, you can derive how much he may have made on average as, as a profit out of this gross revenue. I think that's that's where we where we have a challenge because these these companies have the data, but we need to get them and and interpret it and refine this with technology uh, to make it more uh, to translate it in, into our impact terminology. And I think that you know that that data that inf information, it's the there's that tension I see between it their 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 developmentally focused funds, but they also consider that information proprietary or they want don't want to share it with the competitors. I just feel like if there is public money going in from a donor or a DFI, maybe there should be a higher level of transparency required so that we can have a better idea of, of the impact we are getting uh, for the money that we're putting in. I mean, I noticed that, you know, we often don't even uh, publicly state the, the amount of the investments or what the return we're requiring on that investment. And I'm just, I'm just wondering, yeah, if we should push for, for more just a lot more open transparency on, on those type of numbers, or if it's, you know, I, I, there's reasons I'm sure we don't, but that's that's a question I, I, I think about. Um, here's a question, um, and I think this, I'll read it first. Uh, financing the very poor is challenging because they have to deal with very basic needs. This is for Calvin's Onuka. So can the financing be grants or cash transfers until basic needs are sorted? And I ask this question because Since this is a basically a webinar on agricultural finance, that it's uh, it's it's not a question of whether this should be done, but is this what is this is this an area that we uh, would focus on or have thoughts about? And I think it goes back back to you know how much work are we doing? How much work can we as uh, working in development finance focus in agriculture can we work directly with smallholder farmers? So. That's the specific question. Should we be giving more grants and cash tra transfers for the basic need to help uh, smallholder farmers with their basic needs? I can respond to that. Sure. Um, because I sometimes get the same question um, uh, within our ministry. Um, it depends, to be honest, because cash transfers, um, the way I look at them, uh, I see them as a social safety net, right? So, um, if I'm completely honest, uh, the discussion that we are having today, in my view, is how can we uh, build a business case for smallholders to have access to finance and also SMEs to have access to finance. When we talk about cash, cash transfers, we talk about um, uh, a group of people uh, who need a social safety net. And, um, what I see in agricultural finance is that, for example, the One Acre Fund is also an example of it. The One Acre Fund has, uh, as an NGO, has found a very interesting uh, model, a revolving model for a problem that, in my view, partly should have been solved by the public sector in these countries. Um, so, um, uh, so yes, we can use the agricultural finance instruments um, to um, to do cash transfers to those who need it most, uh, but then you're not building a sustainable business case, uh, which we want to build because we want the farmers to have access to finance. So we need to be very careful when we talk about uh, cash transfers. In my view, this is a social safety net kind of uh, thing and which is a public um, public responsibility responsibility for the public sector and not necessarily for the private sector of course we can use the tools of the private sector uh, to facilitate the cash transfer for example in India uh, when Modi wanted to do cash transfers to all the people everybody uh, was uh, obligated to have a bank account um, uh, so that he was able to, uh, to do the cash transfers. So the instruments can be a tool for that. But um, if you want to build a bus uh, bankable business case, we need to look at it from a business perspective and not uh, a cash transfer perspective. 
Thank you. Um, Anouk, I think so we're looking at the clock. Uh, uh, we're gonna start wrapping it up. I'm gonna ask one more question from Mark Steen and uh, about the private sector. Their key task is to procure and produce at the lowest cost possible. This conflicts with the mission of impact investments to increase smallholder farmer income. How, how do your impact investment products deal with this contradiction? And I don't know one way I'd paraphrase this, and, and um, it kind of reminds me of a conversation you and I had, Peter, subsidizing for-profit companies. Should we do it? You know, how should we do it? Yeah, I think it's it's not, but um, at this point is is uh, is very good. Uh, yes, um, um, an SME that buys from smallholder farmers uh, should try to uh, get the lowest price from them. But then it's of course not the kind of social enterprise, impact enterprise we would like to subsidize, right? So by choosing the right SME, uh, that would be the first step. Or even more intelligent, if you provide provide an incentive that they do so, that you try to align uh, your objective and their objective. And with these stink payments, not stink, <laughs> uh, social impact incentive, that's precisely what we did. We said, we're just paying you if you achieve impact. So impact is for us, something is happening at the level of the smallholder farmers. So when they have an improved livelihood, and this is verified, then we are paying you for your impact. We are not giving you a subsidy just because you're, you're making money. We're not paying for uh, products uh, sold or something like this. No, we want to see a, a change in the livelihood of these people. And only then we pay. And that then means uh, there, there, there's not, no longer a conflict of interest or, or as long as our subsidy is big enough, of course. And then they really want that the smallholder farmers have uh, uh, net additional income, that they're better off. And this is really working for them as well, uh, because only then they, they, they get the uh, sink payment, the outcome payment, and can they make their loan. Uh, of course, they could uh, decide that's not interesting enough, the 200,000 from SDC. I rather press out my smallholder farmers and pay the minimum to them. Uh, yeah, if this is financially more interesting, then if that's only what they're interested in, they would go for this. But at least we would not pay uh, sink payments or, or outcome payments. Thanks, Peter. And Alexandra, Anouk, anything you'd like to add just broadly on this question of working with with for-profit companies and um, the best way to approach it? Well, perhaps I, I would like to, to address the, the side of the smallholder farmer, because I think when you when we use our funds to, to work with the smallholder itself, then um, what you would teach uh, the smallholders or by, by providing better better inputs like fertilizer or seeds to to the farmers, they can uh, grow more crops on on their on their fields and thereby increase their income. So it's not all, only uh, subsidizing uh, companies um, and then ask them to well, to to buy their products at the lowest uh, costs, but you you can look look at the problem from the other side and really provide uh, TA to the farmers and thereby increase the incomes just by by enabling them to to get better products from the fields and, and grow better crops. Yeah. Thanks. Any last words, Anouk? Um. I, I agree with uh, what already has been said by Peter and by Alexandra. And, uh, it, maybe one thing to add is that uh, we are always very careful about this because uh, we don't want to distort the markets, uh, which is something that we could be doing when we support uh, commercial companies. And we like to see uh, those companies more as peers that can provide technical assistance, for example. And, uh, when it talk, goes about procurement of fertilizers and seeds, we feel that uh, market prices um, should be applied. But let me stop here. Enough okay, said. thank you. And I think uh, that you might have seen this question from Seagrid, who talks specifically about how you avoid market distortion. So thank you for mentioning it. That, that's another thing I think didn't come out about the blended finance activities is that the subsidy happens in the funds, but you expect those funds typically to lend at market rates or rates comparable in the local markets to minimize the market distortion. 
that they have. I am going to um, wrap it up here. I don't want to push it uh, all the way to the end. Um, I, I just want to thank our panelists again for coming on this call. Uh, thank and also appreciate the, the frank discussion that we, we were able to have. I uh, also remind folks that this uh, is being recorded so people will have, uh, we'll send out a link to the recording uh, when it's ready. And also we'll be going through, I know a lot of questions in the chat, uh, in the Q&A that we did not have a chance to answer. We'll try to answer answer those as well. So before I say goodbye, Michael, just want to make sure there's no other uh, housekeeping announcements from your, your side you'd like to make. Yeah, I just wanted to quickly say that uh, we hope to answer all of the questions that have been asked in the Q&A. And another reminder that we will be sending out the recording of this event along with that Q&A answered uh, shortly, hoping just a couple of business days. So thank you so much, everyone. That was wonderful. Thank you so much for your questions, for your comments. Great event. Thanks, Alexandra, Anouk, Peter, Michael. Bye. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, Thank bye -bye. you everybody for attending. Bye-bye.